All right, so a little about what's going on. Recently, I wrote a book called Shodai Soke. It's about like the founders of all these martial artists from the 20th century. Of course, Masayama's in there, but coming from different martial arts disciplines, I feel like a lot of the time we do our own styles. We're familiar with our own philosophies and founders, but there's a lot of other founders out there and martial artists who have these plethora of things that they said over the years, these philosophies all from the same community. But a lot of the time, because we are in our own style, I feel like we either don't encounter them or we overlook them and not by our own doing, but simply because we don't come across them that often. So that's also why I wrote this book. I've been trying to talk about this book to so just kind of really get their philosophies out there. The main thing is trying to share martial art knowledge within the martial art community. And so a lot of these guys, they have some really good philosophies that I felt like was important to share. And as a snippet of what they have to offer. So the ultimate goal was I'm giving you a little bit of preview, some of the things that these guys said, but I also included all the books they wrote so that you guys on your own, if you like what they have to say, go out there, get their books, see their entire philosophy, their history from their own mouth. So again, I want to give you like a micro snippet. Tonight, I got just one quote from each of them. If the book, it has 10 quotes from each of them, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to cover one quote and then open it up to the board all you guys, and see what your opinion is on some of the things that are said. So I'm going to slide right into the next slide here. And so the, who we're going to be discussing, actually, or is going to be the first person is Anko Itosu. He's actually um, founder of Itosu Ru. We'll go into him more. Before we continue, who has, by just a show of hands, who has heard of Anko Itosu before? So, and that's exactly my whole point. I hadn't really heard about him myself until I started doing a lot of research, and that was the whole problem. Uncle Itosu, as we'll come to find out, is actually considered one of the founders of modern karate alongside Gichin Funakoshi, who was his student, which I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So again, there's a lot of figures here who played a lot in the development of karate as a whole that many of us are just unfamiliar with. And it's unfortunate, which is why I wanted to really put him out there. Now the person we have is Jigoro Kano, founder of Judo. And by a show of hands, who's heard of him? So... All right, so yes, yeah, so Shihan, yes, yeah, so he's more popular. Judo is a more popularized sport, so more people have heard of him. Then we have Gichin Funakoshi, founder of Shotokan. Anybody heard of him? Yep, so some more popular names. Good, good. Got Morihei Ueshiba, uh, I'm sorry, Morihei Ueshiba, founder of Aikido. So again, the more prominent styles, you may or may not heard of them. Then we have Chibana Chosen, the founder of Shorinru. So, yep, another style right there. We got Chojin Miyagi, founder of Gojuru. So again, some, some of the names are very popular, right? other ones more obscure. Then we have Kenwa Mabuni, founder of Shido Ru. So we got him. We got Choki Motobu, founder of Motobu Ru. So he's got, he's got some fun quotes when we get to him. Then we have uh, Tatsu Shimabuku, founder of Ishin Ru. So the only reason I, I, I did Ishin Ru growing up, so that's the only reason I came across Tatsu Shimabuku, again, was because I had done the style. If you haven't done some of these styles, less likely you may come across them. And of course, Masayama. I'm assuming we all know him. So keep on moving here. So these are the 10 we're going to cover tonight. So let's get right into the first one right here. Actually, a little bit of background. So again, in the 19th, 19th and 20th centuries, the Shodai Soke, which founders and former heads of modern jujutsu and karate arts, began to integrate both physical and mental components into their systems for personal development. Recounted in the Judo Memoirs of Jigoro Kano, Jigoro Kano stated, the principal difference between jujutsu and judo is that the former case, greater importance was attached to the fighting side of the art, while in the latter form, its fighting form does not play so important as a part as in the other. So Jigoro Kano was saying that jujutsu, it was the art that has been in Japanese history for quite some time. There's been a lot that was like one of the main arts of Japan back from the feudal era that they would use in like actual combat situations. Jigoro Kano was saying that he created judo based on these but wanted to start integrating some of the philosophy and so that it wasn't just about combat, but was about developing the mind and body together. And that's why he ended up trying to differentiate between judo and jujutsu, which many of the other martial arts masters that we'll cover were trying to do the same thing and add that certain ethical component to martial arts. So then Jigoro Kano and many founders of modern martial arts arising out of Okinawa in Japan have touched upon the idea that the mental aspects of martial arts can be just as important, if not more important, than the physical components, which I just mentioned. So opening up to you guys, do you think martial arts today is more like the jujitsu of old, which is more combat-based, 
or has it reached Jigoro Kano's vision for the future of what martial arts should look like with integrating the philosophy side? So if anybody wants to interject, let me know, or have a hand raised, or if Shihan, you have any opinion. So I think I can unmute anybody who wants to, or... I think it depends on the style. Oh, Chris. Oh, yeah. So it depends on the style. So yeah, fair enough. That's, that's a good summa summation. So it can depend on the style. I agree with that. And then, um, so Shihan, what is? You have an opinion on it? I, I do. You know, I, I was saying. I was thinking about this. It's so hard to, to when when we're discussing martial arts. I can. Um, it's hard to. It's hard to remove myself from the lens of my own school. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, you know, when I think about my school, you know, obviously Kyokushin, we're, we're very fighting based. Um, mm. Uh, we, we do, but, um, but I think, um, I think that the, the, the spiritual aspects, uh, 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 at least in my school are, are equal, if not, uh, at, at least paramount, if not greater than the physical aspects. I don't know that that was always the case, but I definitely feel, um, certainly over the last year, geez, mm -hmm. through, through this pandemic, um, it's helped kind of drive that. And, um, it's interesting. I, I would just say as an aside with, with that sort of uh philosophy that you're you're, you're talking about from uh, Jigoro Kano is um I feel like the pandemic for at least again can only speak through the lens of my own school sort of um for the people that really didn't really dig into technique or the spiritual side of martial arts or, or that just just kind of did the fighting um a lot of those a lot of those people maybe not the long time practitioners but a lot mm -hmm. of them sort of fell by the wayside um, so the ones that really were here to, because it was, there was some spiritual development going on, mm. uh, that's really spoken to them. So again, from my lens in a very long winded way in answer, um, I think we're, we're, you know, we, we've got the, 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 the uh, Jigoro Kano's vision. <laughs> oh, so I, I, I tend to agree with you, especially about being more traditional arts. And then, uh, uh, Rebecca, did you have an opinion as well or interjection? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly coming from Shihan Shan school, but, um, but agreed. I also think, you know, um, this depends obviously on the teacher in terms of the, in the terms of the school and the philosophy and things like that, that get, that pushed. Is it getting pushed as a sport? Is it getting pushed as a, as a comp competitive, um, sort of thing? But I, I, but I also think it has a little bit to do with, um, sort of the maturity of the people who stay, right? I think that the people who stay with martial arts, who don't do it, you know, just short time as, uh, as a, as a kid, basically who, who isn't going to have that lens or the understanding uh, big level. I think, I think most martial artists who stay in it long enough, because you're not going to be competing forever and you're not going to be fighting forever, that there is that sort of development in your advancement, um, of martial arts. Oh, so I tend to lean towards that as well. So it gets, it gets to the spiritual side. I mean, I, you know, again, that's, you know, sort of white belt to black belt and beyond or whatever, but there's sort of that progression, I think, of, of, of gaining more of that spiritual piece of it as you, as you become more and more part of it, it becomes more a part of you. Oh, it, no, I, I, I agree with you there, especially you may start off, like, especially myself, I like the more aggressive aspect, I always was attracted to the combat side of it, as time goes on, you start seeing see. more of the philosophy and it becomes a whole whole experience not just combat and it starts integrating the body and spirit like Jabro kind of said I'm gonna I'm gonna move on because we got quite a bit to cover so I'm gonna go on to the next section here so let's see we got aha now I, that was just the whole introduction first person I was gonna cover tonight we got Anko Itosu so Anko Itosu as I mentioned briefly was the founder of Itosu rule which is kind of just a, it was a traditional martial art from Okinawa that he kind of took and started giving it some more of the modern aspects we associate with karate today, which I'll talk about his biography in a minute. On a side note, the photo that I found of Anko Itosu is actually not Anko Itosu. Supposedly, no photos exist of him. There may or may not. So actually, there's a lot floating around online that there's the photo that you see in large right here has been purported to be Anko Itosu for many years. It was only not too long ago found that that is actually a picture of another martial artist, a contemporary of him is called named Miyaki Sango. The small picture you'll see down at the left corner, new research says that might be Anko Itoso, but it has not been confirmed yet. So again, we're looking from, he was from 1831 to 1915. So a lot of historians have been looking into it. So the other photo here has been proven not to be Anko Itosu. The one on the left, 
may be him. So I thought that was kind of some interesting information there that he's a very big figure, as we will see next, who is helpful in creating karate in the modern era. But um, again, as far as actual photographs, not many people even know if any exist. So let's go right into a short bio. So a little bit about Anko Itosu here. We have Anko Itosu was an Okinawan martial arts master who was considered to be the father of modern karate, a title that is ironically also shared with his student, Gichin Funakoshi, who was the founder of Shotokan. A practitioner of Shorite, a traditional and older form of Okinawan martial arts, Itosu's modifications and traditional aspects would lead to his style later being coined Itosu. -ru. Itosu's student, Ch Chosen Chibana, who I also mentioned, developed Itosu's style further into what is now known and practiced as Shorin Ru. So another thing I found while putting together this book was a lot of these guys not only knew each other, a lot of them had the same teachers over the time. So a lot of them, you'll see some little anecdotes. They knew not only would be contemporaries talking to each other, a lot of them studied together. And yet from studying from the same parent style, you see, we have all these other styles that are now developed. So it's interesting how things have broken off and changed over the years. So continuing his bio, we have becoming a school teacher. Itosu was invaluable in his efforts in introducing karate to the Okinawan school system and simplified older katas into the pinan and haiyan kata so that they could be more easily practiced by school children. So I know we have the pinan katas in Kyokushin. At a Shotokan student, he had the high end, which are the same exact as the peanut. And so you can see that they were apparently were bigger forms at one point. He chopped them down into segments to simplify them to make them easier to learn. So that's kind of interesting how he kind of contributed to even the style that we practice. In his work, The Ten Precepts of Karate, Itosu laid the foundation and framework for what the true purpose of karate practice was meant to be. So not only did he make the peanut, he had 10 precepts which sound the, set the foundation of what he envisioned karate to be, which I'm going to get into one of those precepts right now after we cover some of his teachers. So who taught him some older Okinawan masters was Nagahama Chikuden, who was taught him in Shurite, and then Sokan Matsumura, who also taught him Shurite. And then as far as writings, not much was left behind other than these 10 precepts, were, Eric, which were in a letter that he wrote. So getting into it, we have... So very simple, but it's Says, says a lot. You must decide if karate is for your health or to aid your duty. So that's interesting in the sense that before you even do martial arts, what is your intent? What is the purpose? Why are you doing it? Are you trying to do karate for your own health benefits? Do you want to be a fighter? Are you a maybe a law enforcement agent or you need it for work of some sort for self-protection, military work? So again, what is the reason you do karate, but when you set out into it, it's just out of curiosity, but you need to identify in order to be effective at it, why you do it and then tailor your training accordingly. So I'm gonna open it up to some of you guys now. Why do you practice martial arts? So let's see if you have a show of hands or anybody wants to just jump in, feel free to. Uh, so Rebecca. Um, you know, it's an interesting question because uh, because I think when I started martial arts, I started I started in my mid thirties. I didn't start as a, as a as a child like a lot of people do. Um, I started for health reasons. I said, you know, this was exercise that I needed to get, and and I wanted to you know do something that I would stick with, which a lot of exercise I didn't. Um, so I started with the health reasons, but I think I, I think I, as I've trained, I've added much more to that. I, I certainly still do it for the health reasons. There's still health reasons to do it for sure. Uh, but I think there is sort of a spiritual, emotional sort of side that we talked about that that's part of it as well. Um, and, uh, and I think there is, you know, sort of self, hopefully never having to use it, but self-defense pieces um, as well as I do um, Kyokushin and also I've been training Krav Maga with, uh, with our Sensei Katie. For, for oh, our so yeah, I, I liked what you pointed out. So you may start for one reason, you never know, your intent can change over time. Also, so I think that's an interesting fact. Same thing happened to me, I mentioned earlier. Um, Chian, did you have a point as well? So I'm eating pizza at the same oh, time. Cool. Oh, take like, your time. Oh, so. Talking martial arts, eating pizza in the dough, this is like, I'm, uh, this is really fantastic, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it. Um, I was thinking of, of a few things. One is uh, exactly what you, you and um, what Sensei and, and, and Rebecca said. Uh, I, I think it ebbs and flows and it, and it changes. It's changed over time for me. And I, I think... Um, 
maybe the, the thing for me is um, not even really asking myself why when I'm having peaks and valleys um, along the way. You know, I'm also a musician, so I, I, uh, being, in, being involved in, in, in the arts of all types oh, um, has sort of always been part of who I am. And, and there are times where um, you're on the gas pedal, off the gas pedal, and, and um, I, I guess I just kind of stopped asking myself why and just sort of allow it to happen, you know? But I think um, when I think about martial arts as like backstory for my own life, I don't know that I have a, an answer to, to, to the why because I, I just feel like it's like I don't even think I have, a, have had a choice. I, I know that it, I know we have a choice, but it's, there's just something that's always it's always ticked. It's always spoken to my my heart and my soul. So it's just something that's happened. You know, I, I think now the practice is much more about for me um, continuing to uh, stay in shape, you know, um, remain somewhat vital, but also I think it's important as teachers, you know, um, I've always felt the sensei, shihan, uh, senpai, whatever the title you have, you have a responsibility to continue to be engaged and find your, and continue to feed your passion if you're going to continue to teach people. That's to me really critical because I, I think that we have a lot of people in martial arts, I'm sure we, we all know many of them, um, that, um, what they say is not necessarily what they do. And it doesn't mean you have to be able to, like, it doesn't mean I have to throw a, a high Jodan kick the way Reg, Senpai Reggie can now, who's 16 years old. But I, I need to be trying to still be able to do things, you know? Um, so, I don't know, that's a long-winded answer. Right? Well, I'll, I'll, we're going to cover something similar with another guy. But I agree with you. After a while, I mean, as teachers and instructors, you don't even ask why. It just becomes, it becomes so ingrained into your way of life and your lifestyle. You, you, don't, you just do it. And it's just, there's no question. So again, I, I like that. It was very good, Shion. Uh, oh, thank you for that. Thank you, Sensei. So anybody else, or I'll, I can keep moving, Chris. Yeah, you know, I'll just, I'll yeah, I'll just throw in real quick. I, very similar to to the two comments that were already made, but I think for me, it's also just over the years, it's just become something that's always called me. You know, it's like beckoning me to get back here and, and keep doing it. Find, find another style that that really really draws you into it. And uh, so far what I found with studying with you, uh, Sensei Kyokushin is, is uh, that, that seems to, to hit that. And it just pushes me to a different level of, of where I'm at now, you know, and, and see where I can go with it. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you for the positive feedback. Yeah. Uh, Dwayne, do you have it as well? Or? Yeah, uh, so I'm fairly new. I've been here for about probably like two weeks now. And this is probably the longest I ever stuck out with an uh, actual martial art. I wasn't really engaged. You know, I tried Taekwondo, mm. wasn't really engaged, but this one actually pushed me to my limit. And, you know, I actually feel like I'm actually learning and I'm actually having fun at the same time. So, yeah, that's my answer. Oh, well, again, thank you for the feedback, Dwayne. I'm happy to have you in class. So, thank you. Oh, all right, guys. Well, then, thank you again for contributing. That's what I wanted this all about. Anytime you guys, I appreciate you guys engaging in the conversation. So I'm going to move on from, that was Anko Itosu. So let's go on to, I think we got Jigoro Kano next. Yes, we do. So we got Jigoro Kano, the founder of Judo, which he was around from 1860 to 1938. And again, sounds like it was a long time ago. It wasn't even 100 years ago. The 20th century was only so long ago. So a lot of these guys, it seems like, ah, they were so, they're so old, what can they contribute? They were the predecessors of, Karate, which really developed in the modern era. And so these founders really were not that long ago, which is what I really wanted to, what I found interesting about a lot of their dates and time frames. They lived well into the 20th century and had a lot to say and contribute to the arts. So a little bit about Jigoro Kano. Jigoro Kano was a Japanese educator and martial artist who would go on to become the founder of Judo, a system of martial arts rooted in Jujutsu, which he covered in the beginning. He helped judo become the first Japanese martial art to gain widespread recognition through having it inducted as an official Olympic sport. In conjunction to his contributions through serving on the International Olympic Committee, Jigoro Kano also served as the Director of Education for the Ministry of Education in Japan. As Director of Education, he contributed to the successful effort to have judo as well as kendo become public education programs in the 1910s. So already from the beginning, Jigoro Kano was trying to integrate the martial arts into the education system, trying to show that they are inseparable according to him and that it's all a mental development in conjunction to the physical side. So he really wanted to integrate 
the whole thing as part of education as a whole and not separate, which was interesting. So I'm going to keep moving for the sake of time. We have his teacher. So we had a couple teachers. So he, from Fukuru Hachinosuke, he learned Tenjin Shinyoru. From Iso Masatomo, he learned Tenjin Shinyoru. And then Ikubu Sunatoshi, he learned Kiroru. So again, a couple other older jujitsu grappling style arts he learned. So again, there was quite a bunch of them at the time coming out of the feudal era. And Jigoro Kano took them and condensed them into judo for what he believed was a good system. And then writing. So here you got a lot for you. If you want to read from, because he was an educator, he wrote a lot. So he has quite a few. So as far as books worth looking into, you have the Kokushi. The Old Samurai Art of Fighting Without Weapons, Judo. Then you have Judo, the Japanese Art of Self-Defense. The Contribution of Judo to Education. The Principles of Jujutsu. Principles of Judo and their Applications to All Phases of Human Activity. Olympic Games and Japan. Judo, or also Jujutsu. Jujutsu and Judo, what are they? Jujutsu becomes Judo and Mind Over Muscle. Writings from the founder of Judo. They are all great. I have a couple of them. Some of them are articles you can find online. If you're looking for just a quick version or like a good condensing of his philosophy. That last one, Mind Over Muscle, is a really good book. You can find it on Amazon. So if you ever want to check that out, I recommend starting with that one. And then you have a ton more to go from there. So let's get into one of his quotes, which is actually from Mind Over Muscle. So you have, judo practitioners must not be performers. People are often heard talking about who won or who lost in this or that judo or boxing or wrestling match competition. But the essential purposes of judo are completely different from those of boxing and wrestling. So it is not advisable to engage in competitions with each other. While it is not impossible to agree upon certain conditions and compete with each other, this is not pure judo competition, but rather a kind of modified form of judo competition. So I picked this one because it's quite controversial, I believe, because again, as Kyokushin fighters, we compete all the time whether it's for become, trying to become a world champion, whether it's for our own betterment, whether we're trying to learn from it. So we can find meaning and purpose in competition. A lot of us do compete. Jigoro Kano was trying to say winning and losing isn't so important. Competing is not really important. While you can compete, it's not the true form of the martial art as he envisioned it. And so I thought it would be a good one to hear feedback from others. Because again, I really want to hear other people's views. So my thing is, do you agree? What do you believe is the purpose of competition or is there no purpose at all and you don't agree with it like Jigoro Kano? So I'm going to open it up to you guys. Do you agree with Jigoro Kano on this point where he is not a fan of competition or at least does not believe that it is martial arts in its purest form? Oh, Shion, oh, uh, sorry, I just, I don't know what happened to my screen here. You know what I did, Brad? I don't know what, this one? Yeah. yeah. No, uh, oh, give me one sec. This oh, one? You're visible. You're visible, Sheehan. Okay, great. I, I'm trying to get back to where I saw everybody. I can't see the the um. Uh, click on you once. Sorry, Sensei. Oh, let's take your time. Place pin. Yeah. Yeah. No. All right. Well, I got you, but I I don't have the shared screen, but that's okay. Well, I'll get back to that. I, I don't want to waste everybody's time with that. Um. So that's a great question. And, and, and uh, my answer to that is um, I certainly don't think it's everything. I don't think I, I, I think it's I think it's an important part of, of, of any of, of several systems, certainly in Kyokushin. But I guess what I'll, I'll, I'll follow with, with this is a, a, just a quick story about a student who was having a real challenging time um, uh, with fighting at one point in, in, in and um trying to figure out what does fighting mean? What did it mean to him? You know, what, what was the purpose? What, how did he feel about going out and thinking about trying to hurt somebody? And in Kyokushin, as you know, you know, no pads or, pad, you know, knocking somebody out, kicking them in the head, giving them a concussion, all, all that kind of stuff. And through lots of conversations and lots of different senseis and people I reached out to, to, to give him uh, support to help him process this, what he, what he came to eventually, which I think is why I think it's important, um, the fighting aspect, is if it's looked at just from 
you know, the competition aspect of that we any for any any competition where we end up with a trophy or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think the point is missed. I think that there is something to um, taking two people and and um, looking at it as just a, 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 a an ex a more intensified training. So I think I think if we can put it into the context of I, I'm going to. Uh, allow this person and this person's going to allow me to go to the deepest place I can go aside from a street fight where I could kill them or they could kill me. Right. But, but, uh, where, where we're going to, here's the rule set and go, you know, and, and help each other rise and, and, and figure out, you know, at times what we're made of or what we can come back from. I think that's a really important fire test, uh, for martial arts. And I can only speak from my lens of Kyokushin, but that's why fighting to me, um, that's why fighting is, is important to me. Um, uh, that's a great answer, Shion. So I pre appreciate that. I like the idea, continuation of training. It also motivates, I think, that the short-term goals of a competition motivates you to go that extra mile. While, again, overall, intrinsically, you should always be pushing yourself. I think when the imminence of a competition is coming, you really want to push yourself beyond bounds, and you also want to see how your training stands. And so it gives you, like, again, a learning experience. How is my training going? You go fight, you see how well you're doing. And so that's one way to be looking at it. But I agree. It's, it's, it's a good answer, Shion. Oh, thank you. Sensei. And then um, anybody else want to uh, contribute? Or... I'd, I'd, oh, I'd like to. Of course. Um, I, uh, I like the competition um, because being an older uh, guy, um, going into even going into competitive, like, like the Kyokushin fighting, um, like when I was young and I studied self-defense, I thought that I was some kind of, you know, good self-defense guy. And if, if anything ever went down, I'd be able to take care of myself. And then uh, as I got older and now I, with the kill chain, um, I stress out enough about tournament fighting that I, I kind of like it. I like it because it makes me have to worry about my breathing while somebody's trying to hit me and I'm trying to hit them and, it makes me target things and it makes me try to be calm in a place where I don't feel calm, where I'm stressed out and stuff like that. And so even though the techniques, you know, for Kyokushin, I worry about my guard being here. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's, it's helped me be calmer in, in other situations that, uh, you know, so I, I think it has like really cool values. Well, that, thank you for that contribution. I, it's, it's, it's a good answer, too. It's, not, it's more than just competition. It helps you become more confident in general in life and, I guess, feel more. Oh, well, thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Tom. Anybody else before we continue? I just, uh, just to add uh, just a tiny bit to um, actually what both um, said by Tom and uh, Shian Strong said, there's a – because competition isn't like my my favorite favorite thing in the world, but um, but you do it because it does push you further. And I, I do think that there's a certain amount of um level that you don't get in class, mm -hmm. uh, a, a well that you have to reach into, it, as Shihan would say, uh, that you have to dig into in competition that you don't in class. And I don't think it until you get in that ring, mm -hmm. um that you really know the difference. Uh, I don't think I would know the difference if I hadn't um, tried to compete at that at that level of, you know, now you're fighting not against somebody that you know in class where you're sort of respecting each other and kind of doing, but you're really gonna dig deep and um, do your best and and they're gonna do their best. <laughs> and and it, it's just, a, it's a, it, it actually raises what you're doing to a different level, I think. Um, and again, I, th I think, completely agree with the if you're going there for the trophy then then you're missing the point um but if you're going in there to as you said right see where you are see see oh. where you can and I, I think you i think you see that in a much much different way in competition especially in semi knockdown or knockdown fighting um than you do in in just a any other setting no i, I like that and also like how you said they may not be the best or biggest fan of like the competition, it's, it's hard and it takes you out of your level of comfort. I tell my students all the time, even I have to do it to myself. Take the exercise or workout you hate the most. And that's the one you're going to do because it's going to, if you don't like it, obviously it's harder. So that's the one you need to be working on. So that's kind of how I look at it sometimes. Uh, anybody else before we continue? I think we're, 
Oh, all right, guys. Thank you for your contributing on this one. We're going to move on. So I know for the sake of time, we have, I'm not sure we'll hit everything, but I got, I got the time. Anybody who wants to stay, we can continue going. So let's um, move on to ah, Gichin Funakoshi, founder of Shotokan. So he was from 1868 to 1957, so all the way up until the 1950s. So let's move quickly through a quick introduction to him. We have, I'm sorry, I just got to adjust where the tag is. All right, so Gichin Funakoshi studied the traditional Okinawan styles of martial arts, including Shorite and Shorinbu, from which he helped further develop karate into what we know it as today. The development of karate built upon the framework left by his teacher, Anku Itosu, who we covered briefly, and hence, they sometimes are known to share the title of the father of modern karate. Because as we know, Shotokan is a very popular style. Although while we practice Kyokushin, most people would have heard of Shotokan. So because of its popularization, Gichin Funakoshi and making it become a very prominent style is associated with being also known as the father of modern karate. Although it was Anku Itosu who really set the foundation, Gichin Funakoshi is more widely known, it seems. So Funakoshi changed the kanji for karate to mean empty hand instead of the traditional Chinese hand in order to give it a unique Japanese identity and to separate it from traditional Chinese tempo, although still borrowed much from it. Both a poet and a philosopher, which we, as you discussed, Shihan, being a martial artist sometimes involves being an artist in other ways, whether it's music, we have poetry here. So I think as martial artists, sometimes we pursue other arts as well. And then uh, he's saying that he was also an assistant teacher in the Okinawan school system. Gichin Funakoshi wrote many philosophical martial arts works that are still in circulation today. So let's get into some of his teachers and his writing. So as far as who taught him, we have Uncle Asado, who taught him Shorite, Kendo, and Kyoru. Then you have Uncle Itosu, as we mentioned, who taught him Shorite. Then we have Matsumura Sokan, who taught him also Shorite. So we came from a very traditional Okinawan style background, but then you also had Kendo, which was a more traditionally Japanese art. As far as writing, so he had a few, not as many as Aguro Kano, but he still had quite a few books. So we have Tote Ryuku Kempo, you have Karate Jutsu, Karate Do Kyohan, The 20 Guiding Principles of Karate, The Spiritual Legacy. Oh, we don't want to do that. Sorry about that. So the 20 Guiding Principles of Karate, Karate Do, My Way of Life. We also have Karate Jutsu, the original teachings of Master Funakoshi and the essence of karate. So again, quite a few books. All are good. I've read a couple of them. Again, 20 Guiding Principles. It's a really good one. That one I, again, recommend if you're looking for a good overview. It has 20 chapters in it. Short chapters really kind of covering the overview of his philosophy. So I recommend if you're looking for just a place to start, 20 Guiding Principles is a great book to start with. And of course, Get as many as you want, but if you want to start somewhere, that's a good one. So let's move on to now the course. Here we have in all our studies, continuous concentration and diligence are the hallmark of success. It is meaningless to begin the study of karate as if you are stopping by a roadside stand for refreshment on your way home. A random sampling of karate or random practice will not suffice. Only through continual training. Will you be able to obtain uh, in mind and body the fruits of the way? So Gichin Funakoshi, as we discussed, Shihan is looking at martial arts as a way of life. It's a whole lifestyle. It's not just a sport. You see many of those different seasonal sports. You do a sport for one season, you do another one another time. According to Gichin Funakoshi, martial arts is more than just that. It's a whole experience. It's a way of life. It's training. It's mental training. It's spiritual training. It's body training. And so he's looking at it from a different light. So... With that in mind, do you agree? Is martial arts more than just a sport? More so, do you have to keep pursuing it? That's why we have the ranking systems. And is it more for, I mean, it gives you little increment measures, but do you got to keep pursuing it? Is it really a lifelong process? Or do you think some people do treat it more as a sport sometimes? You see MMA a lot of the time where it integrates it. You see a very one-sided combat aspect of it. Do you think that martial arts, I mean, as Kyokushin guys, I know where a lot of us lean more towards the way of life aspect. Not everybody does, though. Conversely, when you're learning about martial arts or seminars, like the one I'm doing here, so I put it here, or learning other styles, useless if not continued. So, I mean, if you're not, if this is the only time you hear of martial arts philosophy, was it even worth doing the seminar or should you continue 
it outside of it? Or is it beneficial to know a little bit here and there? Like actually myself, I am not proficient in jujitsu by any means. I am not that great at it. I will once in a while do jujitsu though, because I want to improve my grappling, at least familiarize myself with it. So again, I am by no means proficient in jujitsu and do very poorly in it, but I will still subject myself to that training every once in a while, just for my own edification, just to kind of feel more, again, pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone. I'm not that comfortable with the ground game. So I want to go put myself in that situation a lot. Do you think that unless we pursue things to the fullest though, is it useless? So again, I'm going to open it up to you guys. What do you think? So it's, so if anybody wants to, we have Chris Os. Yeah, Os, I'd have to say that uh, all, all learning is always good. Mm -hmm. The more you, you can learn, the better off you're gonna, going to be. You're going to be more well-rounded. But I think you have to pick a style and, and stick with it and get as much out of it as you can. Uh, get to the highest level that you possibly can with it. But um, I, don't, I don't know that just by taking a, 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 like a, a one-day class in a particular style, I don't know how helpful that is. I mean, you're going to get a taste of it, but you can't then go out and think that you're, you're uh, Bruce Lee, right? Oh, uh, you have to, you got to train to the, to the deepest parts of the arts, I think. Oh, I think you raise a good point. Like um, the sampling aspect might be good if it's your initial onset. Like you want to know if you're going to pursue something, you want to know more about it. So you might want to try another style, another art, find out more about it in order to find out if it's right for you, I guess might be one way to look at it. So that also brings up that. But like you said, in order to become proficient at anything, you definitely need continued training. So um, I'm going to open up. Anybody else want to contribute to this one or we can move on? I'll just quickly add on to, I, I mean, I sort of agree with it. I, I almost think it's two, two different questions, right? Okay. So that like oh, you're sort of asking, dude, is it, you know, sort of a lifelong thing? Yes. I mean, that's just in general, you have to follow through. And I think, you know, you, you have to pick it at least maybe not one path, but generally one path sort of where you're headed. But um, the seminars keep the, you know, the view open, right? So that you're not stuck in, I, I think that people who get stuck in their own one style can get very much into this is, you know, this very closed off view of what martial arts can be. Um, which is not to say that you're going to become proficient in anything from one, you know, seminar or one anything, but that doesn't mean that it's not valuable. I think I think that people who get stuck in the this is the only way to do it um, can, that can be very detrimental. I think to martial arts. Oh so no, I I like that interjection. That's a, that's a good point. It helps gives you something else to get you get to kind of break up your training. You can learn more outside of what's you're doing every day so again that's also why i like to do these seminars i can raise that point why are you doing the seminar is it going to be useless or is it just changing it up what you're normally doing and it gives you something a little extra that you weren't before so that's kind of it's a good point there and then uh, oh shihan yeah no i, I was gonna I mean, obviously I totally agree with chris and 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 rebecca in, entirely um obviously yeah i, I think more such as a lifelong path and all that kind of stuff. I think we all agree with that. But uh, the, the seminar thing, I, I think what I've, where I've gotten to with seminars, because I, I love taking different seminars and half the time I end up leaving them. If I'm training, you know, a, a Jeet Kune Do seminar, I'm like, that was so amazing. What the hell did we do again? Like, I can't even remember <laughs> it. So, so it's more just like a little window to, 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 get, to, to be humble or at the very least to be humble by somebody else. Go, wow, this person's so like, as, as good as I think I might be in Kyokushin for the moment. Wow. This, this is a, but I also think that what I've found, what, why I think they're important is if you are on a particular path where you have dedicated your, your life or whatever, a period of time towards a particular art, what you start to find is the similarities in the different systems and styles, or, the, or you take a concept or, or even a, a combination or technique and say, okay, here's a Jeet Kune Do thing, or here's a, here's a Wing Chun Kung Fu. That's not the way I do it. But how would I integrate that particular motion or that combination if I was going to do this in... in karate or in kyokushin so really kind of boiling it down to how you how you approach your art so i think those things they, they can feed your art i think to, to to leave a seminar thinking you know other than wow that turned me on i really want to go study that more but to think that you know we're going to get a seminar and be like oh yeah you know because like i said i at, at my point and i don't know if tom will agree <laughs> and back at our age we, we get out there and, and the three of us were usually taking the same seminar so that one of us remembers something we learned <laughs> oh so i like that it's a good point too Shia, uh, Shia. like you might pick up something from it 
that you can integrate into your style. Even if you don't remember, like you said, you can't become proficient in the Jeet Kune Do in one seminar, but they might have something that we could definitely find useful in what we do. So, oh, thank you for that interjection. Oh, and then anybody else would want me to keep on moving? I... All right, I will keep on moving to the next slide. So let's see who we have next to keep this going. Aha, Marihei Ueshiba, the founder of Aikido, who was in 1800, 1883 to 1969. So he was living well into the 20th century here. So let's find out a little bit more about him. So Marihei Ueshiba, he was a martial artist since his youth. Rei Ueshiba served in the Japanese Army during the Russo-Japanese War. After being discharged from the Army in 1907, Ueshiba went on to study Daito Ru Aki Jiu Jitsu under Kiteda Sokaku until 1919, whereupon he joined the Omoto Kyo Shinto sect in Ayabe and opened up his first dojo. From there, he would go on to open numerous dojos throughout Japan and promote the martial art of his founding Aikido up until his death. So he was actually a soldier in his early life joined a Shinto sect, was really heavily involved in the jujutsu styles of martial arts, took them, made Aikido out of it, and that is an art that we still see a lot today. I mean, you had Steven Seagal really helped promote that art back in the 80s and 90s, and still today you see Aikido places all around. So into his teacher was, we mentioned already, he just had Takeda Sokaku, we talked about Daito Rocky Jiu-Jitsu, writings. He had a couple. He had the secret teachings of Aikido, Budo, teachings of the founder of Aikido, and the Art of Peace, which again, if you're looking for another good book, Art of Peace is a really good one. It's a very short book, like one, like little maxims on each page. If you're looking for kind of understanding his whole philosophy, he was very much about martial arts being more internal, a personal development. Competition wasn't so much competition against others. Competition is against yourself and having getting rid of evil desires and what he was really looking for, kind of purifying yourself, more of looking at martial arts and a meditative sense, again, being part of the Shinto sect. I think actually his, uh, his teacher actually went and founded his own type of religion and Shinto sect on his own. So you can see that spiritual aspect a lot in his writings and the mindset of Aikido is more to a whole new extreme, more about personal development than strictly combat. So let's get into one of his sayings that we have here. So his quote I picked out was, I, oh, this was a good one. Iron is full of impurities that weaken it. Through forging, it becomes steel and is transformed into a razor sharp sword. Human beings develop in the same fashion. So I picked one that was, I personally like. So he's saying that like anything else, trying to keep it simple, martial arts, you got to strengthen yourself. You start off, you're not, no one's proficient in anything when you first start. You're a beginner. Only way is through hard training. You must constantly practice and practice, and you slowly over time, you get stronger and stronger. Like a sword, too. If you stop practicing, like a sword, you start rusting. So you got to keep up. So I, like, I liked particularly this analogy of comparing your body and training to the creation and maintaining of a sword. In order to make it stronger, you have to constantly work at it. And so do you believe this mindset can help you on your martial arts journey? So again, do you think that viewing training for outside of, of course, you have to train to get stronger. You hear that all the time. Do you think like an analogy of this sort it can serve as a reminder almost as to what you're doing and why we have to continue doing it, I guess is a better way to put it. So if anybody wants to interject onto an opinion on this. I'll cycle through some of the screens here. If not, we can keep on moving. If you guys just like it, just thumbs it up. Oh, so yeah, this one pretty straightforward. All right, we're gonna move on to the next one. Oh, so, oh so yeah, we'll keep on going. So, so now we have Chibana Chosen, founder of Shorinru from 1885 to eh, 1969 also. So real quick about him, we have Chibana Chosen was an Okinawan martial artist who was the first to give a Japanese name to a traditionally Okinawan style with his creation of Shorinru Karate. Chosen began his martial arts training at 13 years old and continuously trained up until the end of his life. In his middle years, the destruction caused by World War II resulted in him losing his family, dojo, and means of living. But through perseverance, he was able to rebuild a new dojo and resume teaching after the war. 
He went on to become the first president of the newly formed Okinawan Karate Federation in 1959 and ultimately received the Order of the Sacred Treasure from the Emperor of Japan in 1968 for his contributions to the study and furthering Okinawan martial arts. So quite a record for himself of martial arts development. So his teacher, oh, look who it was, Anko Itosu. He taught him Shorite. And then as far as writings, again, not some of these guys, unfortunately, did not have a lot left behind, but I was able to find he had an interview. It was from the Okinawan Karate Do Association from 1966. So from this interview, you were able to get a little bit snippet of what his personal views were on martial arts. So from the interview we have, if a teacher teaches... With his heart, he can only expect the student to train with their heart. It is only right that both the teacher and the student progress. The student motivates the teacher, and the teacher teaches the student the correct attitude and spirit of martial arts. This is good training, the student and the teacher progressing together. I, I particularly like this one. Again, I've seen it many times even with my students. Sometimes the students motivate you to strive for even better. If you have students not so much even living up to their expectations. You have expectations for yourself to be valuable to them. So you want to keep pushing yourself so you always have something to give them, I guess, is another way to look at it. I know, Shihan, you mentioned earlier in one of the other ones, sim something similar. So again, I'm going to open it up. Do you agree that a student-teacher relationship should be reciprocal or should it be one-sided? Do you think that the teachers and students should progress in this way or is it an unquestionable one-sided type relationship? What is your opinion? Leaving it open to you guys. So, uh, Tom, close. Close. Um, I think that uh, for me, a teacher teaching with his heart is, is really it. It's the difference. Um, it's how I learn now as, as, a, as a person, as a student, as a man or whatever. And I... Uh, you know, it's why I love particularly our place, you know, Fighting Spirit and Shihan, because um, that was evident. He taught my children before he taught me, and they were tiny, and they were spastic, and he was so gentle, and yet I could see the way he carried himself that he was a good martial artist, and, you know, and I could tell by the way he treated my children that he was a good man and a good, good human, and uh, so I, I feel like that's I know there's there's maybe things to learn from somebody who just does that sort of didactic top down approach because you're going to get the straight stuff but training and learning and growing as a person along a path that I consider martial arts instead of just exercise or fitness or even fighting um you know that heart is is so it's the it's the, my favorite thing oh that's Oss. very good input oh thank you for sharing that tom oh oh um, I agree with everything Tom said, uh, but I'll add from, from my own personal sort of journey path, having had a teacher that was a little bit more of the one-sided, um, and coming from that, there's a, there's a really big difference, right? From, 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 from a school that's like that to, to school like FSK, where, um, really a little bit more reciprocal and everybody's sort of more, more equal. And, um, I, I feel like the longevity of people um is greater that people stay longer that 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 the the one-sided might work and it might teach you you know good technique it might teach you um the basics and and other things like that but it's not as sustainable as the 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 school that has that um reciprocal relationship where you can as tom said really grow as a person not just as a as a martial artist oh yeah i tend i i I tend to agree with that approach as well. So thank you for sharing again your point. Uh, anybody else want to add to that or? Oh, all right, we're going to keep, I know for the sake of time and actually it is, uh, so Shion, it is 8.39 now. Do you want me to continue? I mean, I'm happy to continue. If you want me to end it, I'm also happy to do that. I know it is late, so it's up to you. Um, Sensei, you know, th first of all, I, 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 I'm, this is fantastic. Oh, uh, I, 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 like, whether we keep going or not, we, we should do this again because I, I would love to get each through the whole the whole thing because it, it really is fascinating and, I, and, I, and I'm really, really enjoying it. And I know 
Beck and Tom going like this too. So, I, um, and, and I'm sure your students are as well. For me, just with my kids for tomorrow, um, mm -hmm. it's just a kind of a tight time. So okay. maybe if we could maybe do maybe one more, is that possible? Would that oh, be let's do that, and then actually we can touch base. I mean. I'm free at nighttime, apparently, with everything going on. If well, you want to up more of a series like you had before, I'd be happy to come back again. We can continue either with – we can, I can pick a person. We'll discuss that more. When we okay. Have a, send me a message. I'll go down to the next person. We'll finish well, with that, and then we'll continue from there. Thank you, Sensei. Oh, thank you. So final person we're going to cover tonight, we got Chojin Miyagi, the founder of Gojuru, and he was – from 1888 to 1953. So let's see what he had about him and to offer. So we have, through combining traditional Okinawan styles of martial arts with Chinese-based martial arts, Chojin Miyagi founded the Goju style of martial arts. Goju-ru translates as hard sauce style to reflect the writings laid out in the influential Chinese martial arts work known as the Bubishi, the Bubishi where Go represents hard linear techniques and Ju represents soft circular open hand techniques, which I found very interesting. This work, the Bubishi, I was actually, again, unfamiliar with. Very influential. If you look at, especially if San Chin, Tensho, all the breathing katas in Kyogushin, a lot of that came from Goju-ru, where Chojo Miyagi really focused on the breathing and all the other aspects of martial arts. And so it's interesting that it originated in the Bubishi work, which, again, I want to actually get a copy. I've not read it personally, I must admit. But it's interesting how you just so much more to martial arts that we see in our own style that we may not have been as aware of. So then uh, perhaps the most notable unique characteristics of Jo Gojuru compared to other styles of the time was the integration of the Chinese influenced San Chin and Tensho breathing katas that are now present in many Austria styles of Gojuru, such as Ishinru and Kyogushin, which I had just mentioned. So teachers, he learned from Kanryu, Higashiona and Ryoko Aragaki, who taught him, again, they were more traditional Okinawan styles, which again, we have to, I didn't really, I talk about it more on the history side in my actual book, I skipped it for tonight, that a lot of these martial artists came from Okinawa, which again, we'll talk about it another time, it was off of mainland Japan, Okinawa was its own country for many, many centuries prior to that, and so a lot of these guys coming from these traditional Okinawan arts started inter introducing these styles to mainland Japan, which again, we can have another discussion about that another night about that whole history. But continuing as far as writings, he wrote Karate, Karate Do Gaisetsu, Outline of Karate Do, Historical Outline of Karate Do, The Martial Arts of Ryukyu, The Meeting of Okinawan Karate Masters, and then you have Breathing In and Breathing Out in Accordance with Go and Ju, a miscellaneous essay on karate. And so actually the Breathing In and Breathing Out is a, you can find that online in the public domain. Type that online, you can find copies of that pretty much just by doing a Google search, a copy should come from there. And that was one of the other things. Some of these things, great, you can find them in the public domain. Other ones are out of print and are really, really expensive or hard to find. So again, some of the books are not so easy to come across. Other ones, you can just do a search and you can find it that way, which was one of the hardest parts about writing the book was trying to find actual cred credible sources, I guess, was, was the most difficult part. All right, and as far as quote. What is karate? It is the art we exercise mind and body for health, motion, and daily life. But in case of emergency, it is the art of self-defense without any weapon. In most cases, we fight with our bodies, hands, feet, elbows, etc. to defeat opponents. However, in some cases, in accordance with circumstance, we may also use weapons. So he's given a very overview of what karate is. And Rebecca, I believe you touched on a couple of these points, that you may have a certain intent, but the other aspects also fall in line with karate too. So we might have a certain purpose, but there is always more elements to it that kind of make a whole complete thing. Martial arts, we may have a certain part that we identify with most. We may focus on that part, but it is only fragments of a whole. Martial arts is a complete entirety and each style, each discipline, each person may choose something they relate to most, but martial arts as a whole encompasses quite a bit. And so, Final question is, what is karate or martial arts? What is it to you or just what do you think karate is? And I'll leave it up if anybody wants to interject what they believe. And I'm just cycling through different cameras here to see if anybody wants to. If you don't want to contribute, that's also fine. We can just end it on that note. Oh, Shion. Oh, 
like you know, got got to got to can got to answer something. Like you, you know, everybody should have to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm I'm just be, um as I don't have any profound answer. I just just thinking what what's hitting me, mm-hmm. and I may have a trouble articulating it. Um, but I think it's personal. That's mm-hmm. what I think. I think karate and martial arts is very very. It's highly personal. I don't know that it's you know, for what it is for me. It 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 needs to be for anybody else. But I think it's um. So speaking for myself, it's it's at times salvation. Um, it, it's in, in the probably maybe the most profound and deepest form I've ever experienced personally. Um, and uh, it's freedom, I think, um, at, at times. Um, and I guess you know maybe a mirror uh, of how of how I want to choose to look at myself and the relationships I have with people. Um, and and sort of the somehow in punching, kicking, kata, fighting, all of it, kihon. There's there's somehow a way of getting closer to the source of kind of why my feet are walking on the planet, and and how I want to translate that outside of teacher or student in the dojo to the real world. Uh, you know, again, trouble articulating it, but that's you know that's that, that, it, it's 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 that it has. Um, whatever degree of gravity I could explain in words, uh, I feel like it, it, it carries that for me personally. Oh, so I think you actually exemplified a very major point of martial arts. Sometimes it's beyond words. Only through you experience, experiencing it can you really fully understand. It's a lot like, you, just, you actually, Masuyama talks about the Tao, actually, a lot of the time. He actually has some more philosophical aspects. The Tao, the way of the universe, almost in a way, only sometimes, only through experience can you really understand what you're doing, I guess, and what the biggest... Oh, so, oh, sometimes you can't articulate it fully, but there's an understanding oh, among martial artists as to what that feeling is. Oh, oh so. um, Anybody else want to add to that? I, I was going to take a shot, but from I can't follow Shihana, but that's, that sums it up too perfectly. It's uh, uh, It kind of takes full circle to, to where we started the conversation with pushing push myself to a different level. Oh, uh, I, can't, I can't really define what that level is because uh, I don't know that I'll ever get there until I'm uh, mm-hmm. maybe pushing up daisies. I, I have no idea. But, you know, it's just something that you just – I want to keep pursuing anyway. It's, uh, it's really not something that I, that I can explain. But oh, the so way that I, Sean said it, it's, uh, I mean, you know, spot on. It's a personal experience. Oh, so thank you, Chris, for that interjection there. And then uh, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I just was going to say that I think we've had some interesting conversations, uh, Shihan and, and Senpai Tom and lots of people at the dojo this year in particular that has, you know, what is karate martial arts? Again, it, it's hard to maybe put into words what it is in, in a whole because I think we all come from our own perspectives, but there is something about it that has this year in particular, I think, um, made us dial in a little bit to what's important. Um, about martial arts and, and martial arts in our lives and why many of us continue to train even through quarantine and and the importance of uh, how important Zoom has become and, and connecting us around the world. And, and even right, right now we can connect with you. I, I just think there's an amazing um, thing that has happened within this year that in some ways has expanded martial arts um, even more through through this, you know, horrible thing that we've been <laughs> dealing with but like we're we're all through our martial arts rising in, in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise without martial arts through this if that, oh, if that makes if that makes any sense so well, it makes a lot of sense actually and it's ironic if this is the final one we're ending on tonight that we focus so much on the punching and kicking if we have classes we got to get through the class we're pushing ourselves that way and then class is over we go home we forget to take that step back sometimes to have these discussions we don't always get the opportunity to discuss it these Feelings are evident, as we know from our own experience. We experience it. We know what karate is, but we don't always talk about it. And we also lose sight that seasoned martial artists, we understand, the younger ones, people just starting out, may not fully understand it yet or have that direction. And so sometimes it's good to have these discussions to bring it to the forefront of understanding that martial art is more than just the punching and kicking. And I think sometimes, even myself, I'm negligent in having these conversations as much as I would like to. It's just sometimes it's just the matter of time when you're in a class when you're trying to get through things, when you have competitions coming up, you, when you take away from training, you're taking away from preparing for a competition. And so sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and we lose sight of some of the more important philosophical parts, I believe. So I think that was just interesting way to bring it full circle there. 
But um, anybody else want to interject before we end up? Yes, oh, it's Tom. Oh, Sensei, oh, it's everybody. Um, it just, as, as everybody else was talking um, and just the amount of enjoyment I've gotten out of this, you know, like I have the, the smile on my face that I often get at the dojo uh, before or after my day, you know. Um, it's the words that were coming through my mind are like a door, a prism, a lens, an approach. It's a, uh, it's something that if I if I go at other aspects of my life through the lens or the gateway of karate, the things go better. I, it's I've got a more positive approach. I've, I I feel more energy or more potential or joy or possibility about the thing that I'm going after, you know, and uh, so. That, that that was just rolling through my head and it was great hearing everyone who spoke, oh, especially you, Sensei. Thank you. Well, thank you for your contribution. Mean, this is only possible with everybody's contribution. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just the, presenting it to you guys. So again, the feedback that you're able to get something from it, that's really what I was hoping for. So again, I really appreciate all your contrib your contributing, your discussions. And it's again, like you said, Tom, it's good hearing from everybody. I want to hear these. Are, there's no one answer. There's that's the, that's the thing about philosophy, which is why I've always loved philosophy. Which, well, you can have a full discussion. You can actually open it up. One person's going to have one answer. Another person might have a completely different one. There might be some middle ground. You never know what you're going to hear from people, which is why I like, I'm happy that we were able to do this. So then thank you, Shihan, for having me be able to do this tonight. Let's see. Uh, it, it, it's, it, you know, again, <laughs> The, the, the words humble, honor, gratitude, blessing, they all keep coming up, but uh, I, I really feel that. I, and, and Sensei, I felt that since, the, you know, I know it's reciprocal. I know we felt that when we connected in, in New York many, many years ago. Um, this is just fantastic, man. I, it, it's really awesome to, to hear your knowledge and the research you've done, what you've put together. Uh, uh, I, I guess really all, all I want to say, you know, is um, besides thank you and us, is uh, I, I just want to, I want to make sure we, we get to a, a chance to do this again with, with like you said, with me and you can talk on message there and, and figure out a date to, to, to pick out, particularly maybe talking about one or, or going through the next six or seven that we have to do still or five, um, because I, I would love to have more people on this because I'm thinking of a couple things as you were, were, were saying this just in relation to the, um, it was one question you asked and it was something about uh, the teacher student relationship. Oh, so. you know, and, and and what struck me, and obviously my two students know this very well, but you know, I'm thinking, here we are, we're all these all these these wonderful martial artists. They're on, on their on their own paths, yet we're seeing how they integrate, and we're talking, and we're talking about it. And some of us came up in systems where we we, you know, we we came up under people who may have been great great uh, physical specimens in their martial art, but you know, again, I'm speaking for myself. I didn't even know I was allowed to talk. I wasn't even allowed to talk to my sensei growing up. I didn't even know that was allowed. You know, it wasn't until 15 years later when I had another sensei, different one, said, you want to go out for a beer? Said, well, <laughs> me? Well, oh, you, can, you can do that? <laughs> so this is wonderful. I think this type of dialogue is the kind of stuff that's needed um, uh, to go forward, you know, to, and, and to, to continue to unify people. And because, again, taekwondo, karate, whatever, it's, we're all doing, we're all on the same trip. A hundred percent, Shan. That's like also that's why I wanted to do it. Like you said, you, there's so many other, you don't, you don't always get this. And there's so much out there and other styles that don't hear from the other side because nobody communicates and we need more of that. And I, again, I appreciate you allowing me to be able to do this with your students, with you. I would like to get some more people. So we will definitely touch base to do this again. So again, I really appreciate it, Shian. So I know I've already held you guys way longer than we anticipated. So I'm going to, End it for you guys now. Feel free to message me. I mean, we have the, uh, you made the Facebook group right there, the Facebook invite, I guess, for the meeting. Oh, Anybody, I'm right in there. Send me a message anytime. And if you want the book, it's Shodai Soke, or just send me a message there. I think Shion actually put it in the Facebook, has all these quotes in it already, more, some history. And so feel free to check that out. Or if you just want to have another conversation, cool. just send me a message. Send me a message. So. Oh, so, thank you. Oh, so yeah, thank you guys. So you guys have a good night. And oh, Shion, I will definitely touch base with you. And thank you thank all. You. Thank you, Sensei. Oh, thank you, Sensei, for your time. Thank you, everybody. Oh, of course. Thank Stay you. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you as well. Oh, oh.